very good evening to all my dear viewers who have joined here through the youtube today we have once again the master class from medicine a excellent session once again from our mentor dr reshmi shivram ma'am welcome ma'am for the today's session now i hand over the session to you ma'am very good evening to all of you i'm very happy to be back with another session uh, i hope this will also be useful for you guys okay i would like you all to interact in the chat live chat you just post uh, your comments i mean post your views on what you uh, on the topic and also keep answering in between so that we can have an in interesting discussion okay shall we start now can we start dr ragu yes ma'am yeah okay so let's begin with aortic valve disease so before we go into like usual we'll just discuss a question for which the answer will discuss later okay so a 75 year old man comes to his primary care physician's office accompanied by his wife followed by an episode of syncope following an episode of syncope two days ago the patient was working in his garden when he suddenly felt light headed and lost consciousness for one minute his wife who witnessed the incident states that he did not jerk uncontrollably or hit his head the patient endorses worsening shortness of breath and occasional chest pain during his usual morning walk for the past month medical history begins includes benign prostatic hyperplasia which is managed with finasteride his temperature is 96.8 degree fahrenheit pulse is 75 per minute and blood pressure is 138 by 87 mm mercury on physical examination the lungs are clear to auscultation neurologic examination is within normal limits ecg demonstrates voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy so what would you expect to find on auscultation of the heart so this is the question we'll just discuss further and then we'll come back to the question so you'll all be able to answer it easily okay so let's begin first we'll discuss aortic stenosis and then we'll move on to aortic regurgitation first of all what is aortic stenosis aortic stenosis is the narrowing of the aortic valve okay narrowing of the aortic valve yes so what is the normal anatomy of the aortic valve aortic valve is actually ha having three cusps it is called tricuspid valve tricuspid valve because it has three cusps okay okay so this is the three cusps 1 2 and 3 so it is a tricuspid valve so when there is narrowing there is significant obstruction here so the flow through the uh, from the left ventricle into the aorta is obstructed so this causes all the symptoms which are produced in aortic stenosis okay so normally the aortic valve is a tricuspid valve okay if there is any deformity in the tricuspid valve if it is a bicuspid valve or a unicuspid valve then they have an increased propensity to develop aortic stenosis okay so let's start begin with the causes what are the causes of aortic stenosis the first one major the most important one is bicuspid aortic valve like i told you if the patient has only two valve two cusps in the uh, tricuspid in the aortic valve that is only two cusps then they have an increased risk of developing aortic stenosis okay the first one is bicuspid aortic valve the second one is rheumatic heart disease like we all know it is very common in india rheumatic heart disease affects the aortic valve and causes aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation it also affects the mitral valve causing mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation so in this uh, aortic stenosis rheumatic heart disease is a major causative factor especially in the developing countries the third most important one is degeneration degeneration okay degeneration that is in old age older individuals in older individuals due to the calcific process calcification process atheromatous process atheromatous changes which occur on the aortic valve there is degeneration which happens which causes the patient to develop aortic stenosis so the first factor if it is a younger individual you first initially suspect bicuspid aortic valve there may be some abnormality in the aortic valve most commonly a bicuspid aortic valve then the rheumatic heart disease causing aortic stenosis and the third most important one is degeneration which happens in older individuals suppose you find a person in his 70s or 80s developing aortic stenosis then that is most commonly due to degeneration okay so what are the other risk factors which contribute to the development of aortic stenosis so the risk factors 
the first one will be age okay as the age, as the age increases as the age increases there is more arthromatous process so there is more degeneration and more aortic stenosis so old age is a very very important factor then males are at increased risk for developing aortic stenosis males are at an increased risk of developing aortic stenosis so increased age it is com more common in males than dyslipidemia this is understandable because the, when there is dyslipidemia the arthromatous pro pro process will be exaggerated and there will be more degenerative aortic stenosis happening so dyslipidemia and other factors which contribute to the dyslipidemia and arthromatous process including comorbidities like diabetes hypertension smoking all these actually contribute to and increase the risk of developing aortic stenosis so the causes will be bicuspid aortic valve rheumatic heart disease and in older age we suspect degeneration and arthromatous aortic stenosis the risk factors include increased age it is more common in females dyslipidemia diabetes hypertension and smoking all contribute to the development of aortic stenosis okay so what happens in this aortic stenosis is normally there is a valve like this okay the valve is like this it begins to thicken the leaflets begin to thicken causing more obstruction see as you can see as it keeps on thickening the valve orifice becomes lesser okay the valve orifice decreases okay so that is why the aortic stenosis is caused how does this happen that is because there is some amount of inflammation happening there is some amount of inflammation happening which is followed by degeneration and calcification degeneration is accompanied by calcification and this kind of calcification we call it as dystrophic calcification i am sure all of you must have studied in your pathology dystrophic calcification is the uh, calcification deposition even when there is when the calcium levels are normal in the blood it develops on the dead tissues okay so this is dystrophic calcification okay first there is an inflammation then degeneration occurs then calcification occurs so with due course of time the calcification increases and then the aortic valve becomes more and more narrow progressively it is a progressive disease okay and it is slowly progressive it doesn't happen very fast okay so this is what happens in aortic stenosis so let us see how does the heart accommodate to this aortic stenosis what does the heart do to manage the patient with aortic stenosis okay so let us look at the aortic valve so this is the heart and you have the aorta this is the aorta and this is the aortic valve here okay so what happens now when there is an aortic stenosis aortic stenosis is there so what happens there is the blood this is the aortic this is the lv okay left ventricle when there is an aortic stenosis the left ventricle has to push harder to send the blood into the aorta against the aortic uh, stenotic aortic valve okay if you have a narrowing and you have to pump against the narrowing suppose you have a hose pipe and you just block it at the tip and you have to send the water through it you will see that the water comes out through a very great force and there has to be a lot of force in, before the you know before sending out the water so that it can actually jet send the jet out isn't it so the left ventricle has to have a lot of pressure it has to work hard to actually send the uh, blood into the aortic valve okay through the aortic valve so the left ventricle actually is working more and more so the pressure in the left ventricle left ventricular pressure increases okay so what happens the left ventricular pressure increases so the left ventricle end diastolic pressure is more left ventricular end diastolic pressure is more okay the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is more so what happens because of this left left ventricle begins to hypertrophy the left the left ventricle begins to hypertrophy what happens the left ventricle begins to hypertrophy the muscle becomes thicker okay you can see here the muscle becomes thicker here you can see that the muscle is narrow but here because of the increased pressure because it has to work more and more the left ventricle hypertrophies okay so the left ventricle hypertrophies what happens because of this hypertrophy how does this hypertrophy occur actually so the the sarcomeres are laid in parallel the sarcomeres are laid like this and this is called concentric hypertrophy what is it called concentric hypertrophy okay so the left ventricle undergoes 
concentric hypertrophy to actually you know be able to produce that amount of force to push the blood into the iota through the stenotic aortic valve okay i hope you understand the left ventricle works more so it develops concentric hypertrophy the concentric left ventricular hypertrophy happens and that is able to actually push the blood through the iota in uh, through the aortic valve which is stenotic okay so this de this develops more pressure so what happens because of this left ventricular hypertrophy as you can see the left ventricular cavity becomes very small isn't it the left ventricular cavity becomes left ventricular cavity becomes very small the cavity size becomes very very small so what happens during the ventricular filling there is less space for the blood to collect so the left ventricular filling decreases left ventricular filling decreases so the blood coming from the atrium there is very little space for it to come so the ventricular filling reduces what happens because of this ventricular filling there is more pressure here and the ventricular filling is also less okay so there is a large amount of pressure inside the there is a large amount of pressure inside the left ventricle because of this this pressure is actually transmitted to the atrium also because of this the left atrial pressure increases the increased pressure in the left ventricle is actually transmitted to the left atrium also because it is transmitted to the left atrium what does the left atrium do it has to do something to actually be able to manage the pressure isn't it so what did the ventricle do the ventricle hypertrophy similarly the atria also because of the increased pressure left atrium also hypertrophies okay left atrium is also hypertrophies after the left atrium hypertrophies what happens because there is more and more pressure building up all the blood is then transmitted into the there is backflow happening and this goes into the lungs okay and this goes into the lungs so what happens because of the increased left ventricular fill uh, left ventricular pressure the left ventricle undergoes hypertrophy the lv cavity size is decreased there is lot of pressure inside the lv cavity and the ventricular filling is reduced the pressure is transmitted to the left atrium the left atrium pressure increases the left atrium undergoes hypertrophy okay and there is backflow of blood into the backflow of blood into the pulmonary circulation backflow of blood into the pulmonary circulation and this causes pulmonary edema okay so this causes pulmonary edema now you can appreciate why the patient with aortic stenosis develops pulmonary edema over a period of time okay this remodeling happens but when there is a decompensation due to some reason the patient develops pulmonary edema okay so as you can see the patient will come with dyspnea okay what does the patient with pulmonary edema come with he comes with dyspnea isn't it what is dyspnea it is difficulty in breathing isn't it so when there is pulmonary edema the patient comes in with dyspnea what happens when there is exertion what happens when there is exertion we all have learned about exertional dyspnea exertional angina and exertional syncope i'm sure you all heard about it so what happens during exertion why does the dyspnea increase during exertion the heart rate increases heart rate increases okay so when the heart rate increases we all know during the diastole the left ventricle fills isn't it so when the heart rate increases there is very less time for the diastole to happen okay the period of diastole is contracted okay so there is shortening of shortening of diastole there is shortening of diastole so what happens the ventricular filling time is reduced ventricular filling time is reduced so the patient has dyspnea okay so the pressure becomes more and the patient and the, there is again backflow to the pulmonary circulation and the patient has dyspnea so when there is exertion there is more dyspnea okay so i'm sure left ventricular pressure increases so left ventricular hypertrophy left atrium becomes uh, the pressure increases so left atrial hypertrophy occurs then there is backflow to the pulmonary circulation and there is pulmonary edema during exertion the heart rate increases there is shortening of the diastole the filling time is reduced okay so again as we can see when the filling is reduced the left atrial pressure increases and there is pulmonary edema so when there is an exertion the patient develops more and more of dyspnea okay so the patient develops more and more of dyspnea excuse me okay. next moving on 
So this is a picture of the stenotic aortic valve. As you can see, this is a process. There is calcification, deposition, arthromatous change is there. And progressively, the cavity size reduces. As you can see, progressively, the cavity size reduces. Okay. Okay. Next. What happens because of left ventricular hypertrophy? What are the other, other things which happen because of left ventricular hypertrophy? <coughs> when there is hypertrophy, the muscle needs to work more, isn't it? The muscle needs to work more to actually be able to produce a pressure to move the blood into the iota. Okay. So, because the uh, blood oxygen needs, there is more, you know, work workload on the left ventricle, there is need, there is more need for oxygen. So, oxygen demand increases oxygen demand increases because of the left ventricular hypertrophy it has to work more so the oxygen demand increases what happens because of this left ventricular hypertrophy as we all know there are some coronaries which have which go outside on the epicardium on the epicardial surface there are some coronary arteries which get filled during the diastole isn't it so because of the left ventricular hypertrophy because of the pressure because of the pressure, the epicardial coronaries get compressed. Okay. So, because of the pressure in the left atria, left ventricle, the epicardial arteries, epicardial coronaries get compressed. So, the coronary flow decreases. Coronary flow decreases. So, because there is a combination of an increased oxygen demand, there is an ischemic factor and the coronary flow also decreases. So, because of this, the patient develops angina. Okay, why does the patient develop angina? Because of left ventricular hypertrophy, there is an increased oxygen demand in the muscles. And also because of the left ventricular hypertrophy, the epicardial coronaries get compressed. Okay, because of that, the coronary flow decreases and then anginal pain will be there. Okay, you understand? That is because then what happens during exertion? During exertion, there is an increase in heart rate. Okay, there is an increase. If there is an increase in heart rate, what happens? I told you the diastolic time is shortened. The diastolic time is shortened. As we all know, the coronaries get filled during the diastole, isn't it? The coronaries get filled during the diastole. Because the diastolic time is shortened, the coronary flow decreases. This actually ex exaggerates the angina. Coronary flow decreases, and this will exaggerate the angina. So we have exertional dyspnea we have seen why exertional dyspnea occurs we've also seen why exertional angina occurs angina is chest pain okay because of the increased oxygen demand and the decreased coronary flow because of the compression of the epicardial coronaries and also because of the decrease in the diastolic time and the heart rate increases due to exertion the patient develops exertional angina okay so what is the other symptom that we have studied about that is syncope why does syncope occur why does syncope? Syncope is the ju just the loss of consciousness, isn't it? So why does the syncope occur? So what happens is in aortic stenosis, the patient always tries to maintain a fixed cardiac output. This word is very, very important. The patient tries to maintain a fixed cardiac output in spite of the, in spite of the stenotic aortic valve because he wants to maintain the mean arterial pressure. When the mean arterial pressure is, up, is uh, appropriate, then only we will be able to perfuse the organs. So in order to perfuse the organs properly, the patient tries to maintain a fixed cardiac output. Okay. But due to left ventricular hypertrophy, what happens is, when aortic stenosis is there, and the patient has, the patient is exerting. Okay. What happens when the patient is exerting? We all know cardiac output is equal to heart rate into systemic vascular resistance, isn't it? So when the systemic vascular resistance decreases, what happens when we exercise? We have peripheral vasodilatation, isn't it? What, we ha what happens when we exercise? There is peripheral vasodilatation. So when there is peripheral vasodilatation, the sy sy uh, systemic, uh, systemic peripheral resistance decreases. Systemic vascular resistance decreases. When the systemic vascular re resistance decreases, the MAP also decreases. And the card, which means the cardiac output decreases. When the cardiac output decreases, the perfusion to the brain is reduced transiently. So the perfusion to the brain is reduced transiently, which causes syncope. Okay. 
which causes syncope. So what happens during exertion when the patient is having aortic stenosis? Already he has only a fixed cardiac output, which is just enough to maintain the mean arterial pressure. Okay. But when we have exertion, the systemic vascular resistance decreases. So what happens? The MAP also decreases. Because of that, the cardiac output decreases and the perfusion to the brain is less. So this causes syncope. Okay. This causes syncope. Yeah. Will LV and uh, just I've got a question, ma'am. Will LV and LA also undergo dilatation with eccentric hypertrophy? So in the in aortic stenosis, what we discuss is concentric hypertrophy. We will see eccentric hypertrophy with aortic regurgitation. I'll tell you that when it come when we come to that. But when there is a dilatation, we have eccentric hypertrophy. But when there is a I mean the when there is no dilatation, but the LV cavity becomes lesser, it is actually concentric hypertrophy. Okay, so when there's concentric hypertrophy, we cannot dilate. Okay, I hope I've answered your question. Please put your questions into the thing. Yeah, okay, I just, yeah, fine. I hope I've answered your question. Yes. So what happens when you are dehydrated? Suppose you consider that the patient is dehydrated. What happens is blood volume decreases, isn't it? His perfusion will decrease. So in that situation also, when the person is having aortic stenosis, if he becomes dehydrated, then he will land up with syncope. Okay, because the cardiac output will decrease, the ventricular filling will reduce and hence the patient will develop syncope. Okay, so moving on to the physical signs. So in what we have studied now is exertional syncope, exertional angina, as well as exertional um, dyspnea, isn't it? Okay, so moving on to what, what else will happen? Because of left ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular hypertrophy is very important in aortic stenosis. Most of the fact, most of the issues that occur because of aortic stenosis is because of left ventricular hypertrophy only. Okay, so what happens? The LV force increases. LV contraction force increases. So what happens is there is a left ventricular heave. Left ventricular heave. Okay, so this is what you observe in the epical impulse. Okay, we call it an heaving epical impulse. Because the left ventricular is hypertrophy, the left ventricle will stay in its own position. It is not shifted down and out like we see when there is a dilatation of the left ventricle. The left ventricle is not dilated. It is only hypertrophy. So there is a left ventricular heave, which is sustained epical impulse will be there. This is called left ventricular heaving epical impulse. Okay, and what happens because of the left ventricular pressure, left ventricular hypertrophy, I told you left atrial pressure also increases. So left atrium hypertrophies, left, left atrium hypertrophies. So when there is left, when the left atrium hypertrophies, what happens during the later part of the diastole, when the ventricular filling occurs, when the ventricle has to fill blood, when the ventricle has to fill blood, the iota should press, compress, I mean, the iota should contract to actually push blood into the ventricle, isn't it? During the diastole, later part of the last part of the diastole, the atria should contract to, put, to push blood into the ventricle. When this happens, there is a kick. Atrial kick is there. Okay. What is it called? Atrial kick. Atrial kick. That is called an atrial kick. This is heard and this is called S4. This is sound. This, this is what we hear as the S4 heart sound. Okay. This is what we hear as the S4 heart sound. So because of the left ventricular hypertrophy, the left atrium hypertrophies, and during the later part of the diastole, when the atria has to contract into the to push blood into the left ventricle, what happens is there is an atrial kick. And this is we this is what we call as the S4 heart sound. Okay, S4 heart sound. I want you to remember this is very, very important. S4 heart sound is because heard because of the atrial kick, which happens because of the late left atrial hypertrophy, and because of it pushing blood into the ventricle during the la last part of the diastole okay so this is what happens then what happens to the pulse so if the blood is pushed in as a smooth flow okay when the blood is pushed on the left ventricle as a smooth flow what happens is you get a normal pulse you get a normal peak and a fall isn't it you just the pulse moves up and falls down okay but what happens in this the blood the left ventricle is trying very hard to push the blood into the stenotic aortic valve into the iota Okay, because it is struggling very much. So what happens is there is a slow rise. Okay, slow rise and the late peaking. The, the pulse is very slow rising 
and late baking. And this is what we call as pulses parvus et tardis. Okay. Because the left ventricle is finding it very difficult to actually push the blood into the stenotic aortic valve into the iota, it is called, going as very slow one. Okay. So this is called pulses parvus et tardis. Okay. Pulses parvus et tardis. Now let us discuss a little bit more about what will happen for the murmurs. What will happen during a murmurs? So what happens? All this happens during which phase of the cardiac cycle? So left ventricle ejection occurs during which phase of the cycle? It is during the systole. Okay. So all the events of aortic stenosis happen during the systole. Isn't it? When the left ventricle contracts to push blood into the iota. This happens during systole. So when do you expect the murmur to see, murmur to be heard? So this is S1 and this is S2. S1 is the start of systole. And S2 is the ending. Okay. So the, the all the events happen during this process, during this gap. Between S1 and S2, we have the murmurs. Okay. So what happens is so the blood is being slowly tried to be ejected into the left into the iota. So the iota, so we have the iota here. The left ventricle tr slowly tries to push blood into that, into the iota. So what happens? The flow slowly, gradually increases. Once it is able to push all the blood into the iota, then the flow decreases during the diastole. Okay. So we have a crescendo, decrescendo. First, the intensity of the murmur increases and then it decreases. Okay. So the intensity of the murmur increases and then it decreases. So this is called a crescendo, decrescendo murmur. Okay. It is a crescendo, decrescendo murmur. Where do you hear it? Where do you hear it? It is heard in the aortic area. Okay. It is heard in the aortic area, which is the right sternal, right upper sternal border in the second intercostal space. Okay. So this is heard in the aortic area, a crescendo, decrescendo murmur. So what happens? When do you think the murmur will increase? When the volume of blood in the left ventricle increases, the intensity of the murmur will increase. When the volume of blood in left ventricle increases, then intensity of the murmur will increase. Intensity of the murmur will increase. So when will the intensity of the murmur, when will the volume of blood in the left ventricle increase? When there is an increased venous return. Okay. When there is, when there is an increased venous return, there is more blood in the left atrium. There is more blood in the left ventricle. So because of that, the volume of blood in the left ventricle is increasing. Hence, the intensity increases. Okay. Then what happens during expiration? Also, there is increased volume of blood in the left ventricle. So that will cause the murmur to increase. And when else will the murmur increase? After when the afterload is decreased. Okay, when the afterload is decreased. Because more blood will be sent through the iota. When the afterload increase, decreases, that means the pressure is lesser on the other end. Okay, and because of that, there is a lesser pressure on the other end. So left ventricle is able to compress and send more blood into the iota. Because the pressure on the other side is lesser, the uh, left ventricle is able to push out more blood. Okay, so because the afterload is decreased, when the afterload is decreased, the volume of blood in the left ventricle will also move in fast, more faster. So the murmur will have a higher intensity. So this is a crescendo, decrescendo murmur. You all understand? So during the systole, what happens? As the uh, ventricle is trying to contract and push more blood into the iota, the, uh, there, there is a crescendo. There is a first increase in intensity of the murmur and then gradually it decreases. Okay. So this is what we talk of when we talk about the murmur. So let, let us just revise. On physical examination, we have the pulses, powers, et tardis. Along with that, you also have a heaving LV apical impulse. Okay. Heaving LV apical impulse. Okay. I hope you have understood. That is because of the left ventricular hypertrophy. What about the murmur? It is the ejection systolic murmur, which is crescendo, decrescendo in quality. Heard best at the second intercostal space. There is an ejection click. Ejection click is there because of the opening of the aortic valve. When the stenotic aortic valve opens, there is an ejection click. When the stenotic aortic valve opens, there is an ejection click. So it initially starts with an ejection click. Okay. When the stenotic aortic valve opens, we have what is called the ejection click. Okay. Ejection click happens and we have a crescendo, decrescendo murmur. It increases on expiration, on bending forward and also on squatting. When we squat, the ven venous return increases. So the murmur also increases in intensity. So what happens to the S2 now? 
we have seen about S4. S4 will be heard, that is the atrial kick. Okay. So what happens to the S2? So normally, normally what happens to S2? S2 is actually contributed by A2 and P2, isn't it? First we have the A2 and then we have followed by the P2. Okay. A2 followed by P2. So what happens because of the stenotic aortic valve? The aortic valve actually takes a lot of time to close. Okay. So the aortic valve takes a lot of time to close. So because of that, what happens? A2 will be delayed. A2 will be delayed. Okay. So A2 may occur along with P2 or it may occur after P2. Okay. So as you can see, the A2, P2 interval will become lesser and the A2, P2 may become one single sound. It may be heard together, may be a single sound or there may be a reverse splitting. Okay. Reverse splitting as in the aortic valve actually closes later than the pulmonary valve. Okay. So this is called a aortic. Uh, A2, P2 will be closed as it will be heard as a single sound or it will be a split sound. Okay. So single soft S2 or there will be paradoxical splitting of the S2. That is because the aortic valve is actually taking time to close. Okay. So there is paradoxical splitting of the aortic, aortic sound or the S2 sound. Okay. So uh, now next we move on to what are the types of aortic stenosis? What are the types of aortic stenosis? We have two types. One is supravalvular aortic stenosis that is just above the valve and that is another one is valvular. Valvular aortic stenosis. Supravalvular aortic stenosis and valvular aortic stenosis. So we have the aortic valve here. If there is there, if the lesion is because of something on the valve that we call as valvular, if there is some lesion on the above the uh, slightly above the aortic valve that we call it as supravalvular aortic stenosis. Supravalvular aortic stenosis. Okay. So what happens in aortic stenosis? What, how would you differentiate between supravalvular and valvular aortic stenosis? Will you when where where will you hear an ejection click? Like I told you, ejection click is because of the opening of the aortic. Isn't it? So when the aortic valves open, that will be heard only in valvular aortic stenosis. That will be heard only in valvular aortic stenosis. In supravalvular aortic stenosis, we will not be able to hear the ejection click. Okay. In a supravalvular aortic stenosis, we will not be able to hear the uh, ejection click. But what about the murmur? What about the ejection systolic decrescendo, crescendo, crescendo, decrescendo murmur? It will be heard both in supravalvular as well as valvular aortic stenosis. Okay. So the major differentiating factor is you won't get the ejection click in supravalvular aortic stenosis. Whereas in valvular aortic stenosis, you will be able to hear the ejection click followed by the crescendo, decrescendo murmur. Okay. So we'll be able to get that. So this is the thing. Next, we move on to the chest x-ray. How do we investigate the patient? So the basic investigations like chest X-ray and ECG don't carry much of significance in patients with aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation. They're mostly just non-specific findings, which will just contribute for you to diagnose the patient. Okay. So what happens in chest X-ray? You will find that the patient may have a mild cardiomegaly. You can see the calcification of the aortic valve. You can see the calcification of the aortic valve may be seen very clearly if there is a lot of calcification. And when the patient is in pulmonary edema, you can see that the patient has congested lungs. You can find pulmonary edema features. Okay. So this is what you can find. What do you see in ECG? In ECG, you will be able to actually find the left ventricular hypertrophy features. Okay. Left ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular strain. Strain pattern will be seen. So left ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular strain pattern will be seen in or seen on the ECG. Okay. So next, how, what about the echo? Echo is very, very important. So how do you diagnose the patient based on the echo? So we need to look at the aortic valve orifice, the pressure gradient, what are the aortic valve abnormalities and the LVH. Okay. Aortic valve orifice. So when do we call it as very severe aortic stenosis? Severe aortic stenosis is when the valve size is less than one centimeter square. So this is called severe aortic stenosis. This is called severe aortic stenosis. What do you mean by very severe aortic stenosis? And then the valve orifice is 0.8 centimeter square. It's less than 0.8 centimeter square. This is called very severe aortic stenosis. Okay, very severe aortic stenosis. Severe AS is less than 1 centimeter square. Less than 0.8 centimeter square is very severe aortic stenosis. Okay, then we see the pressure gradient across the aortic valve. We need to see how much 
the pressure is required to push the blood from the left ventricle into the iota. Okay, so that pressure gradient is what we measure in the echo. When the pressure gradient increases, that means the severity of the uh, severity of the aortic stenosis is also increasing. We can also find out if there are any aortic valve abnormalities. Like I told you, if we have bicuspid aortic valve, we can see that on the echo. Okay, and we can also find out the degree of left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, so we can also see find out the degree of left ventricular hypertrophy. So how do we manage patients with severe aortic stenosis? Okay, so when the gradient, like I was telling you here, the gradient should be more than 40 millimeters mercury. Okay, we need to remember two numbers here. Less than one centimeter square is severe AS. More than 40 millimeters mercury, the mean gradient increases. It is severe aortic stenosis. Okay, severe aortic stenosis is when the mean gradient across the aortic valve is 40 millimeters mercury, more than 40 millimeters mercury. Okay, so how do we manage patients with severe aortic stenosis? So you must all remember when the patient is having symptoms like exertional dyspnea, exertional angina or exertional syncope, definitely the patient must undergo aortic valve replacement. There is no other option, but the patient the person should have, have to undergo aortic valve replacement. Okay, so if the patient is having less symptoms or if the patient is asymptomatic and he is undergoing some other cardiac surgery, like if he is undergoing CABG for some other reason, for a cardiac problem, then the patient, we, uh, we also include the aortic valve replacement and doing it, do it in one sitting itself. Okay. So we need to know what are the indications for the aortic valve replacement. Okay. So the patient who is undergoing CABG or the patient is symptomatic, definitely then we have to undergo aortic valve replacement. Okay. If the symptoms are less, if the symptoms are less, then we see what, are, what is the ejection fraction of the patient. So if the ejection fraction is less than 50%, if the ejection fraction is less than 50%, we actually do an exercise test and check whether the uh, person is able to, you know, accommodate with the aortic valve, with the stenotic aortic valve. If the symptoms are not increasing, then we don't do the aortic valve replacement immediately. If the symptoms are worsening, that means the patient needs an aortic valve replacement in due course of time. Okay. So when the ejection fraction is less than 50% and the patient is not able to do an exercise test, uh, he's developing symptoms on exercise test. The symptoms increase on doing the exercise test or the BP drops during the exercise test. That means the person has to undergo aortic valve replacement. Okay. And if there is a rapid progression in the disease or if there is a, if there are, or there is severe valve calcification, we now have, you know, gradings to calcify, the, actually grade the calcification on the aortic valve. Okay. If there is severe valve calcification or there is a rapid progression, okay, and if there is an if the patient is undergoing cardiac surgery because for some other reason, including CABG, or if the patient is having severe symptoms, then the patient must undergo aortic valve replacement. Aortic valve replacement is a must. Okay. If these are not there, then the patient may actually wait. You can actually wait and see if the patient is worsening with annual echo, and you can actually educate the patient to come back whenever the symptoms worsen. Okay. So follow-up is very, very important in these patients. So what are the uh, you know, how do you do the aortic valve replacement? There are two options for aortic valve replacement. Okay. So there are two options for aortic valve replacement. You can either do a trans aortic valve replacement. That is, you push a catheter inside and then you do it trans aortic valve. Otherwise, you can do a surgical aortic valve repair. You can do a surgical open surgery and do the aortic valve replacement. So it can be TAVR or TAVI and surgical aortic valve replacement. Okay. So if the patient is having, when do you do a TAVI? TAVI for the patient is when the patient has a high surgical risk, high or intermediate surgical risk is there. When the patient is not a good candidate for undergoing open surgical aortic valve replacement, then we suggest the patient to undergo TAVI or TAVR. Okay. When the surgical risk is more or when the patient is having some bleeding diathesis. Okay, so when the patient is having a bleeding diathesis, we don't allow, we don't tell the patient to undergo a surgical aortic valve replacement because once the surgical aortic valve replacement is over, the patient has to be definitely on anticoagulants. When we do a TAVI, we put the patient on antiplatelets, but not on anticoagulants. Okay, so uh, for TAVI, we put the patient on antiplatelets, not on anticoagulants. So the bleeding diathesis will not be affected. But in surgical aortic valve replacement, what happens is we definitely have to put the patient on anticoagulation and the bleeding diathesis could increase and cause more complications. Okay, so we need to have the patient undergo 
aortic valve replacement through the trans aortic approach. Okay. So, in future, we hope that the TAVI will increase more than the surgical aortic valve replacement because the morbidity will be lesser. Okay. So, how, it, how do you manage the patient? When the patient comes to you with a congestive heart failure or a medical for requiring medical management, the patient is first, uh, the pulmonary, pulmonary measure, what do you do first? We give the patient diuretics. Okay. So, first, we give the patient diuretics. So, next, we move on to the surgical indications. Surgical aortic valve replacement is most important. It has to be done when the patient is having severe symptoms or when the patient is undergoing uh, cardiac surgery for some other cause, including CABG. If the patient's symptoms are worsening rapidly, if the valve is very, very calcific, if the patient is not able to tolerate exercise and the BP drops or the symptoms worsen during exercise, then the patient is suggested to have an aortic valve replacement. That is a definitive treatment that we can give for the patient. Okay. So if the EF is less than 50%, we should definitely consider the patient to undergo aortic valve replacement. So during aortic valve replacement, we use two types of valves. One is bioprosthetic valves and the other one is mechanical valves. So one is bioprosthetic valves and the other one is mechanical valves. So what about balloon valvuloplasty? Like I told you, this is also a transcatheter approach so that you will be able to decrease the morbidity in the patient. It is used for patients with patients who are not fit for surgery. Patients who are not fit for surgery, it is a bridging period. Okay, if they're not fit for surgery, you do this and wait for the patient to improve. Okay, so this is about the management of aortic stenosis. In aortic stenosis, what we have to remember most important is left ventricular hypertrophy, the symptoms exertional dyspnea, exertional angina, exertional syncope, the uh, aortic murmur, which is the crescendo, decrescendo murmur for starting with an ejection click. And S4 heart sound because of the atrial kick. These are all the important things that you must remember in a patient with aortic stenosis. Okay. So let's come back to this question. A 75-year-old man comes to the primary care physician's office accompanied by his wife following an episode of syncope two days back. He was working in his garden when he suddenly felt lightheaded and lost consciousness for one minute. His wife, who witnessed the incident, states that he did not jerk uncontrollably or hit his head. The patient says that his worsening shortness of breath and occasional chest pain are there during his usual morning walk for the past one month. Medical history has benign, he has includes a benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is managed with finasteride. The temperature is normal, pulse is normal, blood pressure is also normal. On examination, the lungs are clear to auscultation. Neurological examination is normal. ECG demonstrates left ventricular hypertrophy. So what would you expect to find on auscultation of the heart? So you can see what are the symptoms that we are talking about. The patient is having syncope. That is exertional syncope. Okay. He was working in the garden. So there is some amount of exertion. So the patient is having an exertional syncope. So the wife states that he had no seizures. Okay, he did not jerk uncontrollably or hit his head. So there was no trauma, there was no seizures. So this is a pure exertional syncope that is happening. Okay, and he also has some worsening dyspnea, exertional dyspnea and exertional chest pain during his walking. So walking is an exercise, isn't it? So there is an exertional dyspnea, exertional angina, exertional syncope is there. Okay, his clinical examination is normal. They have not mentioned about the pulse, the quality of the pulse. Okay. And neurological examination is normal and there is left ventricular hypertrophy. So in this patient, we consider that and considering his age, 75 years, there must be a degenerative aortic valve stenosis. Okay, so what do you expect on auscultation of the heart? What all would you find? First, you will have an ejection click followed by a crescendo, decrescendo murmur. Okay, in the second, in the second that is the aortic area. And then what you will have, you will have an S4 heart sound and you will have either a single soft S2 or you will have a reverse splitting S2. Okay. So these are all what you will find on the auscultation of the heart. I hope this is clear. If you have any doubts, just put into the live chat. We'll discuss. Okay. Then one more question. A 80-year-old lady presented with breathlessness on exertion and chest pain. Auscultation revealed an ejection systolic murmur heard best at the base of the heart. Echo showed reduced left ventricular ejection fraction and left ventricular hypertrophy. Which of the following does not indicate a severe form of this valvular heart disease? Okay. Which of the following does not indicate a severe form of this valvular heart disease? I would like all of you to answer in the live chat. Please put your answers down in the live chat so that we can discuss. Could it be because of, could it be pulses, powers, et tardis, single S2, late peaking of the murmur or wide splitting of S2? Which of the following does not indicate severe form of this valvular heart disease? So in this, we are discussing about aortic stenosis. 
which does not indicate a severe form of this aortic stenosis. Okay, Narsima says three. Third answer, that is late, late picking of mama. Any more guesses? So, Naresh, Dr. Naresh says it is S2, single S2. I want you to read the question again. Which of the following does not indicate a severe form of this valvular heart disease? Yes. So, we shall now discuss um, pulses powers et tardis. So, I told you because of the severe aortic stenosis, the patient, the LV is not able to send the, send the volume of blood as a single jet in a smooth fashion. Okay. So, it is a very slow rise and slow fall. So, that means there is a severe form of the heart disease. Okay. There is a slow rise and the fall. Okay. Then, coming to single S2. Yes. So, Narasimha says one now. No. In pul pulses parvus et tardis, it when the it is only slow, the very way pulses, pulses parvus will be there initially. When the aortic stenosis is less, the pulses parvus will be there. This will be slowly peaking. But with time, when the aortic stenosis worsens, it also becomes the peak also becomes slow and it also becomes slower. Okay. So pulses parvus et tardis, it will be very, very low volume pulse in these aortic stenosis patients. Discussing about single S2, like I told you, because the A2 and P2 contributes to the S2. So what happens when the A2 is delayed? The A2 comes closer to P2. That is, you can hear it as a single sound. Or what happens? The P2 will happen first and the aortic will close later. So there will be a reversed splitting. Okay. So there will be a reversed splitting of the aortic uh, S2, second heart sound. So you get a single S2. So this is also correct. In aortic stenosis, there will be pulses powered at tardis. A single S2 can also be heard. Coming to the late picking of murmur. Why does the late picking of murmur happen? Because when the stenosis becomes more and more severe, the murmur will start to, you know, the, as you can see, you can understand when the tightening is close, when, the, when it is more tight, what happens? You have to put both more and more pressure. Okay. So gradually only the aortic valve opens and gives space for the blood to be ejected. So the murmur will also be late picking. The murmur will also be initially, it can be like this. What happens gradually? It Gradually the peak will be later. Okay. You can see it will be like this. Initially, it can be like this. Okay. So, late picking of the murmur also indicates a severe form of this disease. But there will not be wide splitting of S2. You can have only a reverse splitting of S2 or a single S2, but there cannot be a wide splitting of S2 because the A2 is delayed. It is not the P2 which is delayed, it is the A2 which is delayed. Normally, it is A2, P2. Okay. Uh, aortic S2 is usually A2, P2. When it becomes closer, when the A2 is delayed, it becomes as a single S2 or a2 occurs after P2. So, there is always a delayed, I mean, reverse splitting or a single S2. There can never be a wide splitting of S2. Okay. So, this is the answer. This cannot be happening in aortic stenosis. Okay. Yes. Now, I would like all of you to guess why this girl's picture is here and in what way is it related to aortic stenosis? In what way do you think that this girl is related to aortic stenosis? Yes. In the fourth option, can we think it's reverse split? No, white splitting is different from a reverse splitting. So when we have pulmonary hypertension, what happens is the P2 will be delayed. Okay. When there is a pulmonary stenosis or when there's a pulmonary hypertension, the P2 will be delayed. At that time, A2 will be normal, but P2 will be delayed. So because of that, the split will be increasing. Okay. So white splitting is different from reverse splitting. Reverse splitting is when A2 happens after P2. But in white splitting, the A2 and P2 will be there. Both will be there. But the different gap between the A2 and P2 will be more because either the A2 occurs earlier or the P2 is delayed. This most commonly happens in pulmonary hypertension or pulmonic stenosis. Okay? Yes. So, now, can you all guess why this girl's picture is here? What do you find in this girl? Yes. So this is, let me help you. This is Williams syndrome. Okay. This girl is having Williams syndrome. What happens in Williams syndrome is the person will have supravalvular aortic stenosis. Okay. Supravalvular aortic stenosis. The girl has supravalvular aortic stenosis, hypercalcemia, and the typical facies with the sunken nose bridge and all this is called elfin facies. Elfin 
faces okay elfin faces and they will have mental retardation so supravalvular aortic stenosis williams syndrome is associated with supravalvular aortic stenosis that is why this girl has been brought here supravalvular aortic stenosis hypercalcemia elfin faces and mental retardation not menke kinke disease this is williams syndrome okay supravalvular aortic stenosis hypercalcemia elfin faces and mental retardation so this is characteristic features with the, the depressed nasal bridge and the prominent cheekbones these are all elfin faces okay this is called elfin faces shall we move on now yes so we have now completed with aortic stenosis we now move on to aortic regurgitation so aortic regurgitation is when the valve is leaky okay what happens in aortic stenosis the valve is narrow but in aortic regurgitation what happens is the valve is leaky it is not able to hold the blood in the aorta so what happens when the ventricle contracts in systole the blood goes into the aorta and during diastole the aorta relaxes so that the blood is accumulated then and it is able to perfuse the, all the other organs isn't it but what happens in the in this aortic regurgitation there is a backflow into the left ventricle okay the aortic the aortic uh, valve is not able to hold the blood in the aorta it is not able to approximate properly the leaflets are not able to approximate properly so as a result of which there is backflow into the left ventricle whatever blood is ejected into that a fraction of that will be coming back into the ventricle itself okay so if you say if you are ejecting about 100 ml of blood probably 20 30 ml can come back okay so as the fraction of blood coming back into the left ventricle increases the aortic regurgitation worsens okay the aortic regurgitation worsens when there is the leak is more okay so let's move on so aortic regurgitation as we discussed in aortic stenosis that's a very chronic process but in aortic regurgitation we can have acute as well as a chronic process so when do you get an acute aortic regurgitation when do you get a chronic aortic regurgitation so acute aortic regurgitation the first one will be infective endocarditis the first reason for acute aortic regurgitation will be infective endocarditis there will be endocarditis endocarditic lesions there will be vegetations on the aortic valve which causes the valve to become leaky okay so first is aortic infective endocarditis second will be rheumatic heart disease rheumatic sorry it will be dissection of aorta second will be dissection of aorta when there is a type a dissection of aorta when there is a type a dissection of the aorta the aortic valve is also affected so this will cause cause the valve to be leaky okay so aortic regurgitation will be there first is the infective endocarditis second is dissection of aorta then the third one will be some trauma when there is a trauma to the aortic valve like when there is a knife wound to the aortic valve the aortic valve becomes leaky okay so the acute causes will be infective endocarditis dissection of aorta and trauma so what about chronic aortic aortic regurgitation like we all know the first one will be rheumatic heart disease rheumatic heart disease so rheumatic heart disease actually causes a very chronic problem aortic stenosis aortic regurgitation mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation okay all these are uh, these are usually chronic processes so rheumatic heart disease causes acute chronic aortic regurgitation second will be degeneration when there is a degeneration aortic regurgitation will be the similar to aortic stenosis okay with age it increases okay then next will be aortic valve abnormalities aortic valve abnormalities okay so when there is an abnormality in the aortic valve like we already discussed bicuspid aortic valve or some other aortic valve abnormalities so what happens is they have an increased pro uh, propensity to develop aortic valve disease like aortic regurgitation or aortic stenosis most commonly they will develop aortic stenosis but with time they can also develop aortic regurgitation next the fourth one will be connective tissue disorders okay these are called aortic root diseases aortic root diseases among which the most important we have to know is marfan syndrome marfan syndrome is very very important the next one will be euler danlos euler danlos syndrome euler danlos syndrome 
okay the more two most important connective tissue diseases are associated with acute or chronic aortic regurgitation is marfan syndrome and ehlers danlos syndrome we can also have aortitis inflammation of the aortic valve aortitis and when the patient is having hypertension okay this can also cause aortic root dilatation when there is an aortic root dilatation because of some aortic root disease the person has a propensity to develop aortic regurgitation so aortic root disease will cause aortic root dilatation when that annulus you know it becomes weaker the leak will become incre will become more the leaflets are not able to approximate properly so the aortic regurgitation will be there so aortic aortic root disease the main one is marfan syndrome and ehlers danlos syndrome these two we have to remember marfan syndrome and ehlers danlos syndrome then other things are spondyloarthropathies okay next will be spondyloarthropathies spondyloarthropathies which include rheumatic rheumatoid arthritis which includes rheumatoid arthritis rheumatoid arthritis is very very important spondyloarthropathies then next is the less frequent one which is syphilis the less frequent one which is syphilis which we don't see nowadays so rheumatic heart disease degeneration aortic valve abnormalities bicuspid aortic valve then aortic root disease including marfan syndrome ehlers danlos syndrome spondyloarthropathies including rheumatoid arthritis and syphilis okay so now, now let us see what happens in acute aortic disease what happens in acute aortic uh, regurgitation what happens here so this is the aorta what happens here the, the blood is pushed into the left ventricle from the left ventricle into the aorta it, it goes some of it goes into the aorta but most of it back flow black flows into the left ventricle so most of it back flows into the left ventricle so what happens as a result of that the left ventricular volume will increase left ventricular volume increases so last time when we saw when the left ventricle left ventricular volume increases what does the left ventricle do it will hypertrophy and try to accommodate but this is an acute process isn't it this is an acute process so the heart is not having the time to you know remodel and cause left ventricular hypertrophy there is an acute decompensation so because of the left ventricular volume increase the left ventricular end diastolic pressure will increase left ventricular end diastolic pressure will increase there is no time for remodeling there is no time for remodeling there is no time for the hypertrophy to happen and for the ventricle to accommodate the blood so what happens when there is no remodeling the left atrial pressure will increase the left atrial pressure will increase immediately so this will cause backflow into the pulmonary circulation and the patient will have pulmonary edema and the patient will have pulmonary edema so when there is an acute aortic regurgitation the patient presents with pulmonary edema okay when the patient is having aortic acute aortic regurgitation the patient presents with pulmonary edema okay in these patients the murmur will not be found immediately because it is a very acute process there is no remodeling which is happening and it is a very very fast process the patient comes you comes to you with a decompensation so there is no murmur you cannot hear the classical aortic regurgitation murmur and because the pressure is you know there is pressure the pressure the blood is the blood is sent less into the aorta the pressure will also drop so the pulse pressure will become wider pulse pressure widens okay what is pulse pressure pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure okay and the diastolic blood pressure falls so there will be a lot of difference in the pulse pressure so the pulse pressure will widen how will you identify the patient he comes in pulmonary edema the diastolic pressure will be very very less either it will be around 20 30 or it will be unrecordable while the systolic pressure will be high because of the pressure in the left ventricular cavity okay and there will be no murmur you cannot hear the murmur okay this is called this is what is seen in acute aortic regurgitation so how will you treat this patients you will give you will treat the patient you like any other cardiac failure you will give nitroprusside and diuretics nitroprusside and diuretics and take the patient for aortic valve replacement subsequently okay what should you avoid in these patients you should avoid beta blockers you should avoid beta blockers in these patients okay you should avoid beta blockers in these patients so what happens now in chronic aortic regurgitation chronic aortic regurgitation what happens so acute aortic regurgitation will present pulmonary edema and the patient will not have any classical murmurs but there will there will be a provide pulse pressure 
okay and on echo you will be able to find the aortic regurgitation now what happens in chronic aortic regurgitation like i told you the volume of blood in the left ventricle increases the volume of blood in the left ventricle increases left ventricular volume increases blood volume increases because of that what happens the left ventricle dilates to accommodate this the left ventricle dilates okay the left ventricle dilates so what happens because of this dilatation there is hypertrophy also left ventricular hypertrophy also is there but what is about, what is more characteristic about this left ventricular hypertrophy is the blood uh, the sarcomeres are arranged in series in concentric hypertrophy we saw that the sarcomeres get added parallelly in parallel layers so the girth of the muscle increases whereas in left ventricular hypertrophy in chronic uh, aortic regurgitation like i told you it is called eccentric left, left ventricular hypertrophy in this the, the sarcomeres are added in series okay it is added like this in series so because of that it becomes thinner but, but hypertrophy the left ventricular wall becomes thinner but hypertrophy hypertrophy and you know it becomes dilated so this is called eccentric hypertrophy eccentric hypertrophy eccentric hypertrophy happens so because of this the left ventricular left ventricular end diastolic pressure end diastolic pressure decreases so the left atrial pressure also decreases left atrial pressure also decreases because of the decrease in left atrial pressure the pulmonary edema will be lesser okay pulmonary edema will be lesser mostly the patients with chronic aortic regurgitation they come to you eventually with a very late disease okay and the pulmonary edema happens very very late in the process okay whereas in acute aortic regurgitation we find that the first presentation itself the patient will have be, will be having acute pulmonary acute pulmonary edema but in patients with chronic aortic regurgitation because of the uh, remodeling of the heart because the time the heart has some time for remodeling it undergoes eccentric hypertrophy the cardiac chamber dilates the left ventricular dilate the left ventricle dilates so the left atrial pressure decreases and the pulmonary edema becomes lesser it happens at a later date okay so what happens because of this left ventricular hypertrophy and uh, dilatation the apical impulse will be shifted down and out apical impulse will be shifted apical impulse will be shifted down and out okay and what happens it is a hyperdynamic circulation it is a hyper dynamic circulation hyperdynamic circulation okay because of the increased volume of blood available for circulation it becomes a hyperdynamic circulation the apical impulse will be shifted down and out okay when the what happens when the heart failure progresses when this condition progresses and the heart failure is progressing when the heart failure progresses what happens the strength in the myocardium decreases because of the extensive dilatation the myocardium strength decreases myocardial strength decreases okay the myocardial strength decreases the heart failure progresses the myocardial strength decreases because of that the stroke volume will decrease because of that the stroke volume will decrease what happens when the stroke volume decreases the left atrial pressure will increase the left atrial pressure will increase because the stroke volume decreases there will be more blood in the left atrium left ventricle this will transmit the pressure into the left atrium so left atrial pressure will increase and because of that pulmonary edema will be there okay pulmonary edema will be there i told you the pulmonary edema will not be there when this happens on a very slow process but the patient will come to you gradually with pulmonary edema they will eventually progress to pulmonary edema but it does not happen at a very fast pace it happens slowly as time when the aortic regurgitation worsens and the heart failure is also worsening the myocardium lo loses its strength to contract so the stroke volume will reduce so because of that there will be a lot of blood in the left ventricle and with this blood pressure the increased pressure will be transmitted to the left atrium the left atrial pressure will increase and so there will be backflow into the pulmonary circulation and the patient will develop pulmonary edema okay because the stroke volume increases the cardiac output also decreases so the person will have hypotension this is very very important the person will have hypotension and pulmonary edema so the person will have pulmonary hypertension pulmonary edema and hypotension hypotension will be there okay okay so what happens you have heard about something called water hammer pulse water hammer pulse isn't it i am sure all of you have heard about water hammer pulse what is this water hammer pulse 
when you or when you press when you actually palpate the radial arteries and the ulnar arteries you feel the pulse it will be bounding okay in aortic regurgitation patients it will be bounding but when you lift a hand immediately what happens is the blood will be immediately shift back into the diastole in, in uh, the blood blood will be going back into the left ventricle immediately okay so when the when the when the patient when you are feeling the palpating the uh, radial arteries you palpate it, it will be bounding pulse when you lift the hand and palpate because of the drop in the blood immediately into the left ventricle what happens is the diastolic pressure will fall very very drastically so there will be no pulse actually this is called a collapsing pulse or a water hammer pulse collapsing pulse or a water hammer pulse collapsing pulse or a water hammer pulse this is because of the immediate drop of blood into the left ventricle the, there will be a collapsing there will be a lot of pressure drop because the blood immediately drops into the left ventricle because of the aortic regurgitation okay so this is called a water hammer pulse or a collapsing pulse if you palpate it in the carotid artery it is also called corrigan's pulse corrigan's pulse corrigan's pulse c for c carotid arteries you can palpate it in the carotid arteries so c for c this is called carotid arteries so one more important thing that we must know is the hill sign okay what is it hill sign last class when we were discussing about hypertension i told you that the difference between the lower limbs bp and the upper limb bp will be around less than 20 mm mercury isn't it i told you the pressure in the lower limbs will be more compared to the upper limbs and it is around 20 mm less than 20 mm mercury what happens in patients with aortic regurgitation is the difference increases the difference becomes more than it becomes 40 60 mm mercury the difference between the lower limb pressure and the upper limb pressure keeps on increasing it becomes more than like 40 or 60 millimeters mercury. So when the difference is more than 60 millimeters mercury, more than or equal to 60 millimeters mercury, that means there is severe aortic regurgitation. Severe aortic regurgitation is there when the hill sign, that is the pressure in the lower limbs becomes, the difference in the pressure between the upper, lower limbs and the upper limbs becomes more than 60 millimeters mercury. Then you say that this patient is having severe aortic regurgitation. Severe aortic regurgitation. Okay. Now, what happens? We have seen that the apical impulse will be shifted down and out. Eccentric hypertrophy will be there. The patient will present with pulmonary edema. Because of the cardiac output decrease, he will have hypotension. And the water hammer pulse, which will be collapsing because of the drastic drop of blood into the left ventricle. And the Corrigan's pulse, that is the same one. There will be a drop in the uh, pulmonary drop in the pulse because of the diastolic pressure will be less. Okay. So, this is the, and the hill sign when the difference is more than 60 millimeters mercury. So, what happens because of in the what happens during diastole, the, the ventricle actually contracts during systole, it ejects blood into the iota. But when it is beginning to relax during the diastole, the blood comes from the iota into the left ventricle. So what happens is there is a lot of blood into the left in, in the diastole in the left ventricle. So this rapid filling phase, there is a lot of blood in the left ventricle. So because of this, when there is a lot of rapid filling that is called S3, S3 heart sound is heard because of the rapid filling of the ventricle in the diastole. Because of the rapid filling of blood in the diastole rapid filling of blood in left ventricle during diastole okay so the s3 sound will be heard we discussed in aortic stenosis s4 will be heard because of the atrial kick whereas in s3 s3 is heard in aortic regurgitation because of the rapid filling of the left ventricle during the diastole okay so what do you find on examination what do you find on examination So, this process, aortic stenosis happens during uh, systole, but aortic regurgitation happens during diastole. So, this one is S1 and S2. Then this is followed by S1. Okay. So, this is systole and this is, this is systole and this is diastole. Systole and diastole. So, what happens? This is S1, S2 and again S1. Okay. What happens? The um, iota, the left ventricle pushes blood into the iota in the systole. But the pressure drops gradually. There is a lot of blood in the iota and it just gradually drops into the left ventricle. The pressure gradually decreases from the iota. The diastolic blood pressure decreases from the iota because it ejects, it puts, pushes back most of the blood into the left ventricle. Okay. So there will be a decrescendo murmur. What is it? It is a decrescendo murmur. That is a decreasing intensity of murmur that is called a decre decrescendo murmur. Decrescendo murmur will be heard. 
okay this is a very harsh murmur because the blood is ejected back into the left ventricle at a very very fast pace so this is called a decrescendo murmur which is very very high pitched this is a high pitched or harsh murmur this is a very high pitched or harsh murmur where will you hear it best it is heard in the herbs area herbs area we heard the aortic stenosis is best heard in the aortic area but this aortic regurgitation murmur is best heard in the herbs area okay and when will you hear it best again when the patient is sitting forward leaning forward and the patient has an expiration and, and at the end of expiration you will hear this murmur very well okay so this is a decrescendo murmur because the blood is rapidly pushed from the aorta into the vent left ventricle at a very very fast pace this is called a decrescendo murmur this is a very high pitched murmur heard in the herbs area okay if this aortic regurgitation is because of the aortic root disease if it is because of an aortic root disease like we discussed in the causes then the murmur will be best heard in the aortic area okay the bottom murmur will be best, will be best heard in the aortic area if it is due to some other cause this decrescendo murmur will be best heard in the herbs area okay if it is because of aortic root disease it is heard in the aortic area okay so what are the other other murmurs that you will hear in aortic regurgitation first is the decrescendo murmur heard in the aortic region or the herbs area the second is you will hear a murmur in the um, mitral area also what is the murmur that you will hear in the mitral area because of aortic regurgitation what is the murmur that you will hear because of the increased pressure what happens is so this is the aortic valve and this is the mitral valve okay here this is the aortic valve and this is the mitral valve because of because of increased regurgitation fluid in the regurgitation blood in the left ventricle what happens because of this regurgitation jet the mitral valve will become domed the mitral valve become domed mitral valve becomes domed okay which causes a like a mitral stenosis which causes something like a mitral stenosis because of the doming of the mitral valve when the regurgitation jet is there this actually causes the mitral valve to get domed and this causes something like a mitral stenosis this causes something like a mitral stenosis so what is the murmur that you hear in mitral stenosis you will have a mid diastolic murmur mid diastolic murmur in the mitral area okay mid diastolic murmur in the mitral area okay because of the aortic regurgitated jet what happens is the mitral area of mitral valve will get a bit domed because of the doming of the mitral valve there will be some mitral stenosis which is happening the valve becomes stenotic because of that when the blood is pushed from the left atrium into the left ventricle during the filling phase what happens is the mitral stenosis murmur will be heard or the mdm will be heard in the mitral area okay mitral area the mid diastolic murmur will be heard okay then this is called austin flint murmur what is this called this is called the austin flint murmur austin flint murmur austin flint murmur is the mid diastolic murmur occurring in the mitral area because of aortic regurgitation austin flint murmur is the yes Austin Flint murmur is the mid diastolic murmur occurring in the mitral area because of mitral because of aortic regurgitation. Okay, yes, it's called Austin Flint murmur. That's correct. So, what is the difference between the Austin Flint murmur and the mitral stenosis murmur? How do we differentiate mitral stenosis murmur? How do we differentiate? First of all, we all know what is the quality of S one in uh, aortic regurgitation and mitral stenosis. In Austin Flint murmur, it will be a soft S one. soft s1 or it will be normal whereas in mitral stenosis we all know it will be a loud s1 loud s1 will be there in mitral stenosis whereas in austin flint murmur and aortic regurgitation the s1 will be soft or it will be normal okay s3 will be present in austin flint murmur whereas in ms you will have an opening snap opening snap will be present in mitral stenosis s3 will be heard in austin flint murmur or in aortic regurgitation what about the pitch which is most important Austin Flint murmur will be a low pitched murmur, okay? Low pitched murmur, whereas mitral stenosis murmur will be very high pitched murmur, okay? Low pitched and this will be hyper high pitched, okay? In aortic stenosis, in Austin Flint murmur, because of aortic regurgitation, it will be a low pitched sound with an S3. In mitral stenosis, it will be a very high pitched sound with a loud S1 and ostium and or opening snap will be there, okay? So these are the most important findings that you hear on auscultation, okay? Yes. So what do you hear? Murmurs. You will hear the early diastolic decrescendo murmur. 
in the lower left sternal border, you will hear an Austin Flint murmur, which is an epical diastolic rumbling, which is a mid-diastolic murmur heard in the mitral area because of the aortic regurgitation. All these will increase with hand grip, leg raise and squatting. When there is a severe case, there will be a white pulse pressure, I told you, because of a drop in the diastolic pressure. There will be a bounding pulse. There will be head bobbing. Arterial pulses in the fingernails will be there and thrill over the femoral arteries will be there. We'll discuss some of the peripheral signs of, which are the most important ones, the peripheral signs, named signs in aortic regurgitation. All of you must be very interested in learning about these. But of these, not all are important. A few, a few of the named ones are really very important that you must be knowing. So coming from head to toe, we'll start with the head first. That is bobbing of the head, which is D. Mousset's sign. Okay, D. Mousset's sign is bobbing of the head. Okay, bobbing of head is D. Mousset's sign. The next is D. Mousset's sign. The next is lighthouse sign. Lighthouse sign. What is lighthouse sign? Can anyone tell me? What is lighthouse sign? It is the paleness and redness, alternating paleness and redness of the face. Paleness and redness over the face, which coincides with the heart, uh, which coincides with the pulsations of the heart. Okay. So, D. Mousset sign is bobbing of the head, lighthouse sign is paleness and redness, which is alternating. Next, as we discussed, it's the Corrigan's pulse. Corrigan's pulse or the dancing keratids. Dancing keratids. Dancing keratids. Okay. Dancing keratids. Then, in the uvula, you will have Muller's sign. Muller's sign. This is pulsations over the uvula. Uvula pulsations. Uvula pulsations. This is called Muller's sign. Uvula pulsations is called Muller's sign. Then you can see the brachial, brachial artery. That is locomotor brachialis. Locomotor brachialis. You will see the, like the dancing keratids, this will also be dancing. You will have a very high bounding pulse, which is locomotor brachialis in the brachial artery. Okay, moving on. Next, we have the liver and the spleen. The pulsation in the spleen is called Gerhard's sign. Gerhard's sign that is in the spleen and on the liver. This will be the Rosenbach sign. Rosenbach sign in the liver. The pulsations in the liver will be Rosenbach sign. Next, you have the nail bed. Nail bed pulsations that will be Quinky sign. I have just put this image so that it will be useful for you to remember when you remember it in a sequence from head to toe. Okay. So, nail bed, nail bed pulsations will be pinky sign. And coming to the most important, which is the femoral pulsations. Okay. Most important, if you directly auscultate over the, uh, or directly palpate over the uh, femorals, you will hear the pistol short femorals. Pistol short femorals. Pistol short sign. Pistol shot here, the, that is called the, what is it called? This is called the trop sign, okay? This is called the trop sign. Pistol shot femorals, when you hear it, that is called the trop sign, okay? So what happens when you compress the brachial artery, uh, compress the femoral artery? When, you, when the pressure is applied proximally, when the pressure is applied proximally, what happens is you will hear a systolic murmur. You will hear a systolic murmur distally. Okay, when the pressure is applied proximally, you will hear a systolic murmur distally. When the pressure is applied distally, you will hear a diastolic murmur proximally, and this is called Durosius sign. Okay, Durosius sign. This is called Durosius sign. These are very, very important. And the next is Hill's sign. In the lower limb, lower limb VP more than the upper limb VP, lower limb VP more than upper limb, upper limb VP, which will be more than 20 millimeters mercury. The difference will be more than 20 millimeters mercury. So coming from top to bottom, demosid sign, lighthouse sign, Corrigan's pulse, dancing keratids, then Muller sign, uvula pulsations, Rosenbach sign in the liver, Gerhardt sign in the uh, spleen, locomotor brachialis, pistol short femorals, pinky sign, nail bed pulsations, then systolic, uh, pul systolic murmur and the diastolic murmur, which is Durosius sign, then the hill sign, lower limb, lower limb BP and upper limb BP will be there will be a difference of more than 20 millimeters mercury. These are very, very important. I hope you will remember with this image so that it will be easy for you to recollect even when you are revising. Okay. Yeah. So in severe aortic regurgitation, what happens is there will be very wide pulse pressure. The pulse will be very bounding. There will be head bobbing. 
you can see arterial pulsations in the fingernails, which is called the quinky sign. And there will be a thrill over the femoral arteries. <coughs> thrill over the femoral arteries. Okay. So moving on to the management. How do you manage this patient? First, we do a chest X-ray. Like I told you, chest X-ray and ECG are very, very non-specific findings you have. On chest X-ray, you will have the aortic root dilatation you can observe. And you can also have cardiomegaly. Cardiomegaly, you can see very clearly. Because of the LV dilatation and hypertrophy, you can see a cardiomegaly. Also, on ECG, you will have left ventricular hypertrophy and left atrial enlargement features will be there. On echo, what we can see is aortic abnormalities. You can see the aortic root dilatation. You can see the aortic orifice. You can see the jet, regurgitant jet, the volume of the jet we can characterize and also the left ventricular hypertrophy. How much of hypertrophy is there? <coughs> so you can make out the aortic abnormalities, aortic orifice, jet, volume and LVH. Some numbers are very, very important here. So, <coughs> sorry. So what happens? How do you manage aortic regurgitation? So like in aortic stenosis, when the patient is having symptoms, definitely the patient must undergo aortic valve replacement. If there are symptoms, definitely the patient must undergo aortic valve replacement. This is very, very important. If the patient is having symptoms, we cannot wait for any other sign. So the patient must undergo aortic valve replacement. Okay. So similar to that, if the patient is undergoing any other cardiac surgery, then aortic valve replacement must be done. If the patient is going into failure, how do we characterize failure when the ejection fraction decreases? Okay, when the ejection fraction decreases to less than 50%, EF decreases to less than 50%, that is an indication for the patient to undergo aortic valve replacement. Aortic valve replacement. So if the person is symptomatic, he has to go undergo aortic valve replacement. If he's asymptomatic, but his EF is less, less than 50%, then he must undergo aortic valve replacement. If he's undergoing any other cardiac surgery, then he must again undergo aortic valve replacement. But if the patient is having an IOT, if, if the patient is having a normal uh, LV, that is an LV ejection fraction is around more than 50%, but his end diastolic and end systolic, end systolic diameters are more. If the end systolic diameter, end systolic diameter is more than 50 millimeters or the end diastolic diameter is more than 65 millimeters, then the patient must undergo aortic valve replacement. Remember these numbers. If the end systolic valve diameter is more than 50 millimeters and end diastolic diameter is more than 65 millimeters, these, the questions you can expect in this may be based on these numbers. Okay. So if the end systolic diameter is more than 50 millimeters or the end diastolic diameter is more than 65 millimeters, that means the patient should undergo aortic valve replacement, even if the ejection fraction is more than 50%. Okay, if this is normal, if the diameters are not like this and if it is more, then the, you can just periodically monitor the patient. You can just periodically monitor the, monitor the patient. If you find that it is very progressive and if the aortic regurgitation is progressing rapidly, then again, you can, and, uh, you can make the patient undergo aortic valve replacement. So if the patient is symptomatic, aortic valve replacement. If the EF is less, then uh, you can undergo aortic valve replacement. Or if the EF is normal, but the end systolic diameter and the end diastolic diameter are lesser, then you have to undergo aortic valve replacement. Okay. So next we'll just discuss a question on this. A 55-year-old lady presented with exertional dyspnea and angina. On examination, the pulse was collapsing. Auscultation showed an early diastolic murmur. Which of the following is true for this condition? So is it a crescendo, decrescendo murmur? Is it best heard in inspiration? Is it a high-pitched murmur? Or does the intensity correlate with the murmur? Which of the following is true for this condition? Can you please answer? Yeah. A 55 year old lady presented with exertional dyspnea and angina. On examination, the pulse was collapsing. Auscultation showed an early diastolic murmur. Which of the following is true for this condition? So, aortic regurgitation is an aortic regurgitation murmur is a high pitched murmur. Okay. Aortic regurgitation murmur is a very high pitched murmur. Yes, that's right. So, aortic regurgitation murmur is a high pitched murmur. Yeah. Just to revise, so what, what is an Austin Flint murmur? Austin Flint murmur is the mid diastolic uh, murmur which is heard in the mitral area because of aortic regurgitation. It is a soft murmur. How do you manage a patient with aortic regurgitation with EF 60%, left ventricular end systolic diameter 45 millimeters, and left ventricular end diastolic uh, diameter 60 millimeters? How would you manage this patient? 
how would you manage this patient? He has a normal EF with end systolic diameter of 45 millimeter and end diastolic diameter of 60 millimeters. So how would you manage this patient? Because LV systolic end systolic diameter is less than 50 millimeters and LV end diastolic diameter is less more than less than 65 millimeters. This patient is actually normal, but he has an aortic valve replacement. So we will actually periodically monitor, periodically monitor the progression, periodically monitor the patient. How to differentiate between supravalvular aortic stenosis and valvular aortic stenosis? Supravalvular aortic stenosis, the ejection click will not be there. Whereas in valvular aortic stenosis, ejection click will be there. Murmur will be heard in both the supravalvular as well as the valvular aortic stenosis. So what is Williams syndrome? Williams syndrome is associated with, with which type of aortic stenosis? Yes, very good, Dr. Divya. We are periodically monitoring the patient. Williams syndrome is associated with which type of aortic stenosis? Williams syndrome is associated with which type of aortic stenosis? Yes, it is associated with supravalvular aortic stenosis. Supravalvular aortic stenosis. What is the Hill sign? Lower limb BP, more than upper limb BP, and the difference will be more than 20 millimeters mercury, more than 20 millimeters mercury. It can go up to more than 60 millimeters mercury also in severe aortic regurgitation. What is the pathognomonic finding? Yes, very good, Dr. Aishwarya. Pathognomonic finding in the heart contributing to all the symptoms produced in aortic stenosis. What is the one finding in the heart which actually causes all the symptoms to be produced in aortic stenosis? So what is the finding in the heart which contributes to all the symptoms produced in aortic stenosis? So yes, that is the left ventricular hypertrophy. That's right, it's the left ventricular hypertrophy. Left ventricular hypertrophy is the most important finding in the heart, which is actually contributing to all the symptoms produced in aortic stenosis, which is exaggerated by exertion. Okay. So Dr. Narsima has asked, in chronic air, blood moves from iota back to LV, then how can there be hyperdynamic circulation? Yes. So what happens is, progressively, more and blow, more blood comes and accumulates in the left ventricle. Okay. So there is some amount of blood in the left ventricle because of the iota filling it into the left ventricle. What happens is the, there is more blood coming from the iota also. So there is more blood in the left ventricle. So this causes a hyperdynamic circulation to happen. There is because there is more blood in the left ventricle, it causes a hyperdynamic circulation. I hope that answers your question, Dr. Narsima. Yes, that's right. Left ventricular hypertrophy is the most important finding contributing to all the symptoms produced in aortic stenosis. Yes. I hope it was a very useful session for you. Uh, a bit longer session, but I, it, I, I hope you have I have covered all the points so that and you will have a visual memory of all the signs also. If you remember the aortic regurgitation signs from top to bottom in the manner that I have showed you, you'll be able to remember very well and you'll be able to recollect it faster in your exams. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, if anyone have any doubts or anything, you can just post it in the cover chat box now itself so that ma'am can answer. Meanwhile, I would like to thank ma'am for uh, joining with us today. It was really a wonderful session, ma'am. There was lots of one-liners today. I guess yeah. uh, this will be very useful for even NEET PG or ENESET or a next exam, whatever yeah. it's going to come, it will be very useful. Yeah. So I request everyone to take a screenshot and keep in your some folder or somewhere so that it will be useful for you to revise at the end of the day. Ma'am, Narasimha asked one doubt, ma'am. Yeah. In acute AR, as diastolic blood pressure is low, the nitroprusside causes vasodilatation. Yeah. But the main thing is the pulmonary circulation. The, there is more blood in the pulmonary circulation. So that we have to reduce it. But because of the pulmonary edema, we have to give nitroprusside for a short period to just tide over that phase. After that, you can just manage the patient's aortic valve replacement. Because decongestion of that uh, pulmonary edema is more important at that point of time. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am.
so if you have any more doubts you can just post it in the in dm or uh, you can also post it in the chat feedback form which i am sending in the google for, in your chat box so that any feedback or any suggestion or any topic you want to add on you can just put it in the feedback form so that ma'am will be like adding it on thank you ma'am thank you so much we'll be uh, happy to have you again in our channel and again we will have one more interesting topic for the students ma'am thank you once yeah, again definitely thank you so much Thank you all for joining.